appreciate our bus route, amen? Appreciate, appreciate Tony and Brad bringing all those grandkids in. What a blessing that is. Appreciate Devin and Kristen bringing in my grandkid. Hallelujah. That little guy, man, he just, just eats me up. <laughs> I can't even help it. Devin's like, Dad, when you have Devin, you don't even listen, or when you have Weston, you don't even listen to me. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm trying, man, I'm trying. <laughs> Uh, it's like all of a sudden when that kid gets in my arms, I just everything else in the world just kind of churns off. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, that kid's smile just eats me alive. Makes me want to chew on his legs. <laughs> so <laughs> praise the Lord. It's good to be saved. Luke chapter number two. Luke chapter number two. Uh, kids are a blessing, aren't they? What a blessing, what a privilege. What a privilege that God's honored us to be able to raise kids. A privilege, amen. Great responsibility. I'm excited. Uh, Weston's going to have his baby dedication on the 31st of this month, so we'll do that in that morning service. Excited about that right before he turns one years old. Yeah, that'll be awesome. Be exciting to see that, amen. Let that little fella just tear up a cake all by himself, amen. Eat it up, buddy. It'll be fun. Hallelujah. That's one thing I miss about being little. Tearing up cake. <laughs> you know, I don't miss that, do I? <laughs> it's good to be saved, amen. Praise the Lord. And so as we approach the last few days, we just got two weeks for Christmas, amen, two weeks. Dave, if you haven't got your shopping done, boy, you better get after it, amen. Hallelujah, praise God, amen. The hustle and the bustle of Christmas, amen. One man said, my wife will buy anything marked down. People think, you know, and some of these ladies, they just think that, I shouldn't say just ladies, amen. I, I, I should really say there's men this way too, honestly. If they can get it on a discounted price, they'll buy it, amen. If it's marked down, they'll get it. And it's crazy, amen. And so, I know, amen, I'm saved so much money. No, you spent money, amen, you spent it. And anyways, this husband was talking about his wife. He'd, she'd buy anything marked down, so much so that she tried to buy an escalator, you're down. Get it? Thank you, Brother Tracy. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, Christmas is a wonderful time of the year. It really is. I'm glad Brother Tony's not in here. He's like, bah, humbug. I hate this time of year. I'm like, man, what's the matter with you, brother? Come on. And so, huh? I know what he means, Jen. Stop picking up for the underdog. Amen. My goodness. Amen. You know, her spiritual gift is mercy. It really is. That's her spiritual gift. Amen. Hallelujah. We need that. And so praise God. But anytime somebody picks on somebody else, Jen defends them. It just takes all the joy out of it. You know, I mean, my goodness. <laughs> I'm getting, uh, hallelujah. And so it's good to be born again. And you know, one of the wonderful times, things that Christians get to enjoy about Christmas is that we get to witness. Yes. We get talked about an amazing Savior. Luke chapter number two, verses eight through 20. I want to look at three different, three different groups of people here that witness, three different uh, people, basically groups in this passage that we see that uh, did some witnessing that is important thing to understand that when Jesus came to this earth, when he was born of a virgin, I mean, immediately, it wasn't like a day or two after. It wasn't like all of a sudden, this was something that when, when he came, immediately there was witness. Immediately there was witnessing about this Savior, this, this Lord, this, this babe in a manger from the time that he was born, the very day of his birth, people began to witness about him. And you know, one of the wonderful things that we get to do as a child of God, if you're saved in here, say hallelujah. hallelujah. We get to talk about our amazing Savior. We get to tell others. 
And what a blessing it is. And I want you to see in this passage uh, uh, three different groups. We're going to jump into a little bit further down in the passage than what we read as well. But the first thing I want you to notice is I want you to notice the angels here we see. And uh, look at verse number 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone, angels were gone away, from them into heaven, the shepherds, which one, uh, uh, and the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and grace, Lord. Thank you for all that you do for us. God, you're an awesome God and a powerful God. Lord, I thank you for another opportunity to be able to open your word to preach another message about you. Father, I thank you for the great privilege that you've given me. And Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for just the blessing of being a pastor and a blessing of serving you, the blessing of being one of your children. What a tremendous blessing it is. And Father, I pray, dear God, you'd stir and work in our hearts this morning. Lord, help us. Lord, we need your presence. We need your power. We need you working and moving in our hearts and lives. Lord, help us not to be so-so or ho-hum about this matter. Our Christianity is so precious. Father, thank you for it. Thank you for the blessings you've given us that, Father, not just a home in heaven or getting rescued from hell, but that we actually have a relationship with you, that you are our Lord and our Savior. Thank you. I pray now that you'd work and move as only you can. I pray, dear God, you'd be with each individual under the sound of my voice here at the church and also online that may be watching. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you'd bless in an amazing way. Thank you so much for all you do for us. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. Fill me, use me now. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray. The power of his blood we plead. Amen. The angels. You know, the birth of Jesus Christ was announced by the angel of the Lord. And now, as you know, in the Bible, that phrase, angel of the Lord, is what uh, many believe to be a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Now, we've talked about this before in Christmas past, and not Christmas present or Christmas future, but in Christmas past. And uh, come on now, hang with me, amen. What is that called? A Christmas carol or whatever? You know, Scrooge and all that good stuff. Christmas past, Christmas for the ghost of Christmas. You people are just not with it, are you? And so anyways, let me just help you out a little bit. Get in the Christmas spirit, amen. And you know what? The Christmas spirit ought not just be during Christmas time. It ought to be all year round, amen. And so we see this matter, the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord. You know, I, as I mentioned before, I believe that Jesus announced his own birth. Amen. That's what I believe. I think every time we see the, the phrase angel of the Lord, I think it's talking about Jesus. I really do. And so as we look at this and we see in this passage, uh, this matter of the angels witnessing uh, of this. And, and the angel of the Lord gave witness to the shepherds of this matter. He appeared to them. These angels, especially the angel of the Lord, would come when something special was about to happen in certain 
certain cases in Abraham's day, Genesis 22, 11, it was the angel Lord that stopped Abraham from killing Isaac as a picture of the death of Jesus Christ. In Joshua 5, 13 through 15, it was Christ's appearance to Joshua before his incarnation. He was the captain of the Lord's host and is the captain of the Lord's host. Can I get a witness? And so we see in this passage, this wonderful truth that Jesus came as the angel of the Lord with his angels to announce his own birth. And so we see, and he announced that Jesus is the Savior. We see in verse number 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Are you with me? The Lord's angel announced his birth. An angel, that word simply means messenger. Are you with me? And so angels are messengers. And so in, in the book of Revelation, I'm getting off a little bit on my message, but it's okay. In the book of Revelation, it starts off in chapter number two and in chapter number three, each one of the churches are announced and it's talking to the angel of the church at Ephesus, the angel of the church at Thyatira, the angel of the church. And, and who is it specifically addressing? The angel of the church talking about the pastor, amen. I'm an angel. But the Bible never does say that angels have wings. So anyways, and uh, I'm not telling you to throw away your Christmas decorations. Amen. They're pretty. <laughs> but they don't have wings, just letting you know. And so cherubims and seraphims, they have wings, and, uh, but they're not angels. They don't actually give messages. They actually serve God and, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 that area in there. There's nothing in the Bible that talks about a cherubim or a seraphim ever bringing a message to mankind. Can I get a witness? And so as we look at this and we see this, the, well, one of them fell and he's been giving messages to people, but they're the wrong message, amen? And so that anointed cherub, Satan himself, that covered the uh, throne of God and ministered to the throne of God. And so anyways... Back to the fact that Jesus is the Savior. And so you pray for me, amen. Matthew chapter number one, verse number 21, the Bible says, and she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sin. Amen. You know, don't you just love that about Acts chapter number four where it talks about there's none other name under heaven given among men, amen, whereby you must be saved. What a tremendous blessing. And so we see this matter that the name Jesus is, he is our Savior. Psalm 103, verse number 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. He delivers us from our sins. And so we see this matter, what does he save us from? The penalty of sin. Man, I, I heard a, uh, one of the preachers that really was known for revival. His name was Leonard Ravenhill. He wasn't a, a fundamental independent Baptist or anything like that. But honestly, the man just had the power of God on him. He really did. And he would say things. And I remember listening to a message talking one time. And he said, you know, he was preaching. And he was asking people, what are you saved from? What are you saved from? You've been saved. You say you're saved. What did you get saved from? Huh? What did you get saved from? Did you get saved from drinking? Did you get saved from this or that? Did you get saved from any of these things? Are you with me? You know, as we talk about this, salvation changes lives. And if you're a born again believer in Jesus Christ, there ought to be a change in your life. And listen, I'm here to tell you, when Jesus came on the scene, even as a baby, everything changed. I remember Devin, and, I believe it was Devin, and you, you and Kristen were out on one of your vacations and off seeing someplace, and you took a picture of a sign, and it said something along the lines, Jesus changes everything, something along that line. Was it you? Maybe it was Chris. I don't remember. Did you get that? You remember that sign? It looked like a, an actual uh, 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 city road sign. It was green with the white line around it and everything like that. And it had those words on there. And I was like, man, that is so true. Jesus changes everything. An incredible truth. And even from the moment he showed up at his birth, man, I'm telling you what, what a different atmosphere happened. Yeah. What a change and listen, I'm here to tell you, since Jim Frost got born again, life is different now. And you know what he saved me from? 
He saved me from all kinds of stuff. Yes, I'm not going to hell when I die. Yes, I get to go to heaven when, when, when I die. Listen, but the biggest, uh, the, I mean, look at the life mm -hmm. that I get to live now. Yeah. Look at the blessings that God has poured out as a result of being saved. I have, from the time I've been born again, man, there's a relationship that I never understood and never knew. And you know what the great thing about it is? Brother Tracy, isn't it wonderful? Brother Tracy's been saved since he was 15 years old. That's a long time ago. And so 50 years, amen, I just turned 50, right? And so anyway, he's been saved as long as I've been alive. And so hallelujah, listen, 50 years, isn't it wonderful that his mercies really are new every morning? Amen. Isn't it wonderful that, listen, 50 years later, Brother Tracy is still serving the Lord. 50 years later, he still wants to see people saved. 50 years later, he's still excited about Jesus Christ. He still loves his God and still going for him. Listen, has he done everything perfect? No, amen. Hallelujah. You want to know what? Yeah, I mean, he's a Saints fan. That tells you everything. But anyways, listen, I'm telling you right now, uh, you just, you're, you're in, uh, uh, the, uh, this is Buckeye country. Amen. Bangles, Buckeyes, and all that stuff. You people shake your head all you want. Amen. You drive around Ohio. <laughs> listen, this is Buckeye country, whether you like it or not. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm a Buckeye fan. All I know is, is I'm just not going to raise up any other team. I'm not, I'm not looking for suicide. So anyways, listen, the bottom line is this right here. He's our Savior. Yes. And He does change life. Yes. And man, what a change it is. What a blessing it is to be born again. Amen. He delivers us from sin. Romans chapter number 5, verse number 8, but God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, the simple fact of the matter is, is Jesus Christ knew everything about Jim Frost. He knew everything about me from the very day that I was born until present. And he even knows every step I'm going to take from here to the rest of my life. He knows it all. He knows all the terrible things that I've done. He knows all the terrible thoughts that I've thought. He knows everything about Jim Frost. And yet, he still died for me. And yet... He still loves me. Unbelievable. What grace, what mercy, what forgiveness. Can I get a witness? Yes. And man, I'm telling you what, the Lord wants us to have that same spirit and attitude towards each other mm -hmm. and towards those that are out in the world. Yes. Jesus is the Savior. These angel of the Lord came with his angels and announced the birth of Jesus and told us that he is the Savior, which is going to take this away, the sins of the world. He delivers us not only from sin, but he delivers us from fear. Turn over to Romans chapter number 8 with me. Romans chapter number 8. And I know that, listen, some people struggle with different things. Can I get a witness? The truth of the matter is, is some people have a spearful, uh, uh, just a fearfulness about them. They're afraid. They're scared. And really, as a Christian, we ought not be afraid. Amen? God's not given us that spirit of fear. And the closer you walk with God, you can overcome those things. Some people struggle with other areas of their life, but you can overcome those things. Everybody has besetting sins. Can I get a witness? But the truth of the matter is, is we can overcome those besetting sins by doing what? The Bible says in Hebrews 12, lay it aside. Just lay it aside. In doing what? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We can overcome those things. Romans chapter number 8, this matter of fear, I'm thankful that he delivers us from that. Romans chapter number 8, pick it up in verse number 34. Who is he? Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is what? Listen, there is no gospel without a resurrection. Amen. Right. It's sad to me. I got something in the mail from a, a ministry, a track ministry uh, this week. Opened it up and it, it had a Christmas track in it. And I looked at that Christmas track. There's not a mention of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not a verse. Nothing. It barely mentions his death. And I'm just like, how can, you, you're not going to win people to the Lord without the gospel. Right. Right. And not just the word. 
but the actual death, burial, and resurrection. No resurrection, no salvation. There's no redemption without a resurrection. And so we see this matter. He delivers us from fear. Look at it, verse number 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Now notice it doesn't say that he delivers us from those things. It says what's going to separate us from the love of Christ. None of that stuff can do it. Are you with me? And it's not saying that we're delivered from it. It's saying that we can't be separated from the love of Christ by any of these things. As it is written, for thy sake, we are what? Killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the what? Boy, that's contrary to what common Christianity teaches today. That everything from the moment you get saved, all of a sudden we have a prosperity gospel. Our God delivers us from every heartache, every problem, every struggle, every battle. Listen, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, say amen. amen. And you know that the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. I'm telling you something right now. I know that I'm born again, but you know what? Listen, my life has been full of trial, full of tribulation full of struggle, full of persecution. And you know what? God is good. Because through all of that stuff, you know what? It all comes down to a, a matter of decision. Are you going to mope and complain about it or are you going to give glory to God in it? And the more glory you give to God when you go through these things, the faster you'll, you'll get through them. Because God is good. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, nay, in all these things we are what? More. Not a conqueror. I mean, you got Alexander the Great. You got Napoleon. I mean, they had great escapades of war, did amazing things. Genghis Khan, all of these great conquerors that conquered great parts of the world, the, the Caesars and Rome and all of these different things. And the Bible says we're more than them. Are you with me? More than conquerors through him that what? Loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God's love has a location. And that location is being in Christ and so as we look at this, we see in this passage, we see he delivers us from fear. Jesus is the Savior. When I'm saved, I don't have to fear my eternal destination. I don't have to fear what's going to happen to me in this world and in this life. I don't have to fear all of these outside things because I know 100% for sure that Jesus loves me. And I know that I am in him. And all of these issues and all of these problems, listen, when you're going through problems and struggles and battles, I plead with you as a child of God and as your pastor in all of it, give glory to God. Amen. Don't doubt his love. Don't doubt his presence. Trust him because he does all things well. Jesus is the Savior. And he's not just the Savior of a few but he's the savior of the world. Look at what it says once again in verse number 10. And the angel said unto them, fear not for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to how many people? All people, all people. You know, every time Jesus showed up on the scenes, when he walked on the water in the sea of Galilee onto the boat with the disciples in it, what was the first thing he said? Fear not. Fear not. What was the first thing the angel of the Lord said to these shepherds? Fear not. Fear not. What did he say when he appeared in the upper room with the disciples after his death and burial and resurrection? Fear not. Be not afraid, for it is I. Are you with me? Jesus always calms the fears of his people. Can I get a witness? Yeah. And you can mark it down. 
when you're feeling afraid, Jesus wants to calm those fears. And so as we look at this, we see Jesus is the Savior of the world. He is the Savior. He saves from sin. He saves from fear. And he is the Savior of all people. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed him should not perish, but have everlasting life. First John 5, 1, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of what? Him. So the mark of a true Christian is those that are loved by God will also love those that God loves. Are you with me? We love one another. And so as we look at this, we see this matter. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Jesus is the Savior. And Jesus really truly is the reason for the season. He's the reason for us to rejoice. Look at verse number 13 and 14. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. What a wonderful statement, amen. Jesus is the reason. And on earth, peace. And on earth, peace. What we talked about last Sunday morning, we talked about Melchizedek. He was the king of what? Salem. And that word Salem means peace. He said on earth, peace. Not that earth would have peace, but when Jesus was on the earth, he is peace. Are you with me? On earth peace. Well, I'll tell you, there's not a lot of peace in this world. You're right. The Bible said there wouldn't be. The Bible said all of those things. Go over to the book of John with me really quickly. I want you to see something. John, I believe it's going to be in chapter number 16. If not, I'll get there quickly. I know the side of the page and the column it's in. I'm pretty sure it's right here. Verse number 33, John 16, verse number 33, last verse. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have what? Peace. Amen, Brother Devin. Where? In me. Who's speaking? Jesus. In the world ye shall have what? tribulation, but be of good cheer. Why? Because you get to overcome the world? Because you're a victor? No. Because he is. He says, I have overcome the world. So what's the reason to rejoice? What's the reason to be of good cheer? Because Jesus has overcome. And because you and I are in Christ Jesus. If you're born again in here, say hallelujah, glory to God. Hallelujah, glory to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. I like to preach to you and have you talk back to me. Amen. And so as we look at this, we see this. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Jesus is the reason to rejoice. Whom having not seen ye love, and whom though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Our rejoicing is not dependent on the gifts we get under the tree. Amen. Our rejoicing is dependent on Jesus Christ and our relationship with him. There was one particular set of parents that really rejoiced over the presents they got for their kids one year. And just really an incredible present. They were so happy. They were so thrilled and they were rejoicing over their present. And really they shouldn't have been. But anyways, they were so excited about it. It was a pretty significant present. And they said, we really overdid ourselves this year. We got our kids their own apartments. <laughs> Amen. i tell you. And I think every parent that has raised teenagers up through the years, yeah. Woo! It's one thing. It's, it's a, it's for you folks that are not empty nesters yet, man, I'm telling you what, it is a great thing to be an empty nester. Woo! <laughs> and so anyways Jesus is the reason to rejoice Luke chapter number 1 46 through 47 Mary did have it right those parents were a little bit off the mark and Mary said my soul doth magnify the Lord and my spirit hath rejoiced in God 
my Savior. That's what we ought to rejoice about in this season. And remember that every the giving gifts is not wrong to do. It's a good thing to do. I think it's good for us to give to others. It helps us. And really, our lives should be marked by being a giving person. It really should be because Jesus gave himself for you and I. We ought also to give ourselves. Amen. <clears throat> And Mary had this thing figured out. Acts chapter number 2, verse 6 to 47, the early church had it figured out as well. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. I'll tell you, I think one of the big reasons that maybe our society, we're not seeing as many people saved today is because our churches are not as giving as they used to be. Brother Joe touched on something this morning I thought was really excellent. Go to Romans with me if you would. I want you to just see this. I think it's not just good for the men, but I think it's good for the ladies, too, especially the ladies. Hey, man, especially the ladies. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Chapter number 15, he touched on this, and this is so good. I'm just going to look at a couple of these verses, verses 1 and 2. If you're there, say amen. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the what? And not to please what? And not to do what? Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Jesus took the reproaches of us all. Can I get a witness? And so we ought to be marked as Christians as this matter of giving. And so praise the Lord. We have a reason to rejoice. Amen. And that reason is our Savior. Jesus is the Savior. He's the Savior of the world. And he is the reason for the season. This is the reason why we give gifts. This is the reason why we decorate our homes and all of these things as Christians. It's not wrong to decorate your home in, Christ in Christmas time. You know, there's a whole group of people that the, the, the uh, church, there's people that teach that the Christmas tree is an idol and all of this other stuff. And there's some passages in Isaiah that talk about being ordained, or, or, ornamented and all of this other stuff and being decorated. And, 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 but it's talking about worshiping the actual tree. It's not talking about having a tree for beauty and decorations and putting lights on it. I mean, really, I mean, you can make a big deal out of anything you want to. You know what I mean? And you can twist the scripture to say anything you want it to. You really can. But it's not wrong to have a, a tree. What is the, the Christmas tree, particularly a, a type of tree? It's an evergreen, a representation of everlasting life. Are you with me? Something that is living forever. Amen. An evergreen is green all year round. Are you with me? It never, it, are you with me? And so that's why it's a representation of eternal life. The lights on the tree, the, light, the different colors of lights have a different representation. But it, it's the talking about the light of the world, amen? It's that everlasting light. All of these different things. The Bible talks about ornaments in the Bible and, 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 and all of these things. And it's, it, it's, it's not wrong to have that as long as you're not, when, when before you go to bed at night, getting down on your knees in front of your tree and praising the tree. Oh, Christmas tree. The old Christmas tree. Do you think maybe that song's a little bit of idolatry right there? God help us, amen. Man, I'll tell you what, nothing wrong with having a Christmas tree in your house, having some presents under there. Those presents are a picture of, of the gift that was given to us. What a tremendous blessing. Amen. We have an awesome God and it's okay. You know, I understand that there's all kind of paganism out there and stuff like that, but let's, let's not try to, let's, let's glorify God. Amen. Our Christmas decorations ought to be a representation of God's glory, ought to be a representation of Jesus Christ. And so anyways, and I'm going to stay away from Santa this morning. Amen. I'm not even going to mention that Santa has taken the place of Jesus Christ in too many homes. I'm not even going to say that. And I'm not even going to say that if you just switch two letters around in Santa, you get Satan. And I, I'm just not going to say that. And I'm not going to say that he's wearing a red outfit with white trim 
Are you with? I'm not going to say that as a representation of the blood of Jesus. Hey, listen, I'm just not even going to talk about that at all this morning. And so anyways, moving along. I'm not talking about it. I'm just not going to talk about it. The picture of gluttony and sin and all of that. I mean, I'm just not going to talk about it. And so anyways. He knows whether you're naughty or nice. Mm. Help us, Jesus. Amen. Oh, God, help us. You know, one of the things that really stuck to me over the years was Julie's dad mentioned one time that when he found out that Santa Claus wasn't real, he just didn't believe anything he couldn't see anymore. His parents lied to him all those years, and when he found out that Santa wasn't real, it really killed faith. Tooth fairy, Easter bunny. We lie to our kids when they're growing up, and then we wonder why they don't believe us when they become teenagers. Help us, Jesus. Amen. Anyways, I am leaving that alone from here on out. I promise. I'm just going to leave it alone. Preacher, you're crazy. Oh, I'm not so sure I'm the one that's crazy. But anyways, we've got the witness of the angels. And then also I want you to notice, secondly, the, the shepherds. Amen. The shepherds. Look at verse number 16 with me. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. I've heard some crazy preaching on the manger. I've heard people say, well, historically it was in a cave and all of this stuff, and it was a presentation of the tomb, and boy, they tie all kinds of stuff into this. I've heard them say that that trough that the animals ate out of was the manger he laid in, and, and it was stone, and <sighs> it was a manger. It was where animals ate, and I don't know if it was stone or if it was a cave or if it was any of those things. I don't know because we don't know. And so we can suppose a lot of things. Yes, back in those days, some people did use caves to house their animals. But we don't know if that happened in Bethlehem. Are you with me? I just, some of that stuff just makes me crazy. I know they were in town, and I know that, that the, there was a manger there in that area that they ended up at. And uh, I would dare say it was in Bethlehem, wasn't in some cave. I just don't think so, amen? And so there's all kinds of reasons and, and, and try to get to preaching. It's like the, the folded napkin of the resurrection in the tomb. Yeah. Uh, I can't find any historical evidence of that folded napkin anywhere that he left at the end of the thing, just the folded napkin. And boy, people preach whole messages on that thing. The, the closest I could find was a, a, a knee. Uh, what was that preacher's name? Watchman Knee. Watchman knee. That's the oldest point. That's the only reference I can go to. He preached a message on the folded napkin, and I couldn't find any historical evidence on that at all. And boy, they make a whole deal out of that. That folded napkin represented this, and I'm coming again, and all of these other things. And I'm like, okay, well, maybe so, but hmm, take and make a whole message and, and, and not use one single verse of Scripture. But anyways, help me, Jesus. I'm just rambling now. You better help me. Amen. I'm going to be here for a while. Not only do we see the angels, but also the shepherds. The shepherds witnessed the Lamb of God. They saw him there in the manger. They saw that babe lying in a manger. They saw Jesus Christ, that virgin-born child. They saw the Savior. They saw Christ the Lord. They saw exactly what the angel of the Lord had told them, and they went and they saw him. They saw this baby. They witnessed the Lamb of God. It's interesting that the, the Lord, the angel of the Lord appeared to shepherds that were watching their flock by night so that they could not watch their flock, but they could actually see the Lamb of God 
What an incredible thing. Because I tell you, a shepherd probably understands this story more better than, than most anybody else. And we see uh, the, the shepherds and their, their witness. They saw him. Isaiah chapter number 4, they saw the promise of this lamb. Isaiah chapter number 7, verse number 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. Now that's New Testament, not that verse. But anyways, we see the the promise of the land. He is fulfilled. They got to see the promise of what was prophesied all the way back in Isaiah. Then not only do we see that, but we also see the revelation of the lamb. We see the revelation of the lamb. Look at verse number 16. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. They saw the revealing of him. They got to understand the promise and the revealing of the lamb of God. What a tremendous blessing that is. There's a story that I read about about President George W. Bush in November 27th of 2003, and with extra, nobody knew about this, but he went overseas to visit Iraq. His purpose was to thank the U.S. troops for defending the American people from danger. And while there, the president served up Thanksgiving dinner to 600 stunned soldiers in a mess hall at Baghdad's airport. With regard to this Thanksgiving visit to the soldiers from far from home, Bush said this, it's got to be lonely for them. I thought it was important to send that message that we care for them. The unannounced visit not only brought wild cheers from the battle-worn soldiers, but also stunned the nation and even surprised the president's parents who were expecting it at home for Thanksgiving. <laughs> Listen, in similar manner, God, who had formally delivered his message through others, made a surprise personal visit to the world on the f that first Christmas, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Can I get a witness? When God wanted to show a sinful world that he cared, he came in a person. Even now, the impact of the incarnation should take us by surprise. A simple story. We've heard it so many times. The virgin birth, the babe lying in the manger, the angel of the Lord and the angels. We've heard it so many times, the shepherds going and seeing the babe and then going and telling everybody. We talk about it. We go over it. We talk about it. Every year we talk about it. We read the Christmas story. Is it still special? Is it still, wow, I, I just amazing that God would do this for us. That God saved a sinful people like us. That God came to this earth. And then not only did he save us, but, but, but he gave us something to do. He gave us a relationship with him. That we have that. That we can communicate with him. Is that just ho-hum today? Wow. A God that cares so much that he's made sure that we have a copy of his perfect preserved word. Yes. He can communicate with us. And not only that, but that we can also communicate to him. That he would actually care about the little things in my life. And he does care. He cares about the way that we feel. He cares about what we think and how we think of him. He cares about all these things. He cares about it so much that he's made sure that he wrote it down in here for us to help us with our feelings, to help us with our thoughts, to help us through life. He's given us the instruction manual. And not only did he give us the instruction manual, but he also gave us an inner witness to help us to understand the instruction manual. He didn't just give us a book and say, figure it out. But when we accepted Jesus Christ our Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in, who the Bible says guides us into all truth. Are you with me? He's done all this for us. He's established the local New Testament church so that people have a place to come, not sit at home and watch on TV. Yep. Amen? Yep. And for people that do that, I mean, I'm glad that they're watching services and stuff like that, but it ought not to be just sitting at home. God has a special place for the assembling of his people. And so we see the shepherds. The shepherds weren't just content to hear what the angels said. They went into Bethlehem to see it for themselves. They wanted to see it. 
They wanted to be a part of it. What a tremendous thing that God himself would be born of a virgin, such a lowly birth in a manger by such an exalted king. John chapter number one, verse number 29, the Bible says, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Can I get a witness? And not only do we see not only do we see the promise and the, 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 the revelation, but also the sacrifice of the Lamb, the great cost of our redemption, the blood atonement. Listen, I'm here to tell you something right now. It's an amazing thing. The goodness of our God and how powerful He is, what He's done for us. He shed His own precious blood. Boy, it's an amazing thing. I'm glad that I got the real thing. There's a story of a young woman, and they worked together, his, her and her mom worked together in an office. And uh, the young lady, this is back in the days of when fax machines were just coming out and stuff like that. And, and uh, she got a fax machine in the office, and, and uh, she kept on talking to her mom about just use the fax machine. It's cheaper. It's quicker. It gets there right now. It doesn't cost as much. It's very cheap and inexpensive. Just use that for your business correspondence with people and stuff like that and all those things. And, you know, even after that, and she talked to her and talked to her about it, she just kept on using and just putting that stamp on there, sending those letters, putting that stamp on there, sending those letters. And then Christmas came rolling around. And mom finally decided to use the fax machine. And she sent a fax for her Christmas present of a $100 bill. And in the note, it said, you're right. It is much cheaper to use the fax machine. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. I wonder if she got the point. Yeah. <laughs> mom was basically saying it's very impersonable. And you know what? Jesus came himself. It's not impersonal. He's made our relationship very personal. Yeah. Yes. To be actually a child of God, to be a child of the Father, but not only that, to be a, a brother to Jesus, to be a sibling. We're joint heirs with Christ. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. Are you a child of God? Yes. Yeah. Amen? Amen? The Bible, Paul, one verse in the entire Bible, it talks about sons and daughters. Yes. We're the children of God the Father. Jesus was the only begotten son. Are you with me? We're siblings. We're the children of the father. We're siblings to Jesus. And man, not only that, being a member of a local New Testament church is vitally important. People don't seem to understand that. Because the local New Testament church is the bride of Christ. Every single relationship that a person deals with, God has given us. These relationships we have physically on this earth is helps to understand our relationship with God, yep. not the other way around. Are you with me? Amen. And so as we look at this and we see this matter of this sacrifice, Jesus came to express his love sacrificially. God gave the lambskin to Adam and Eve in the garden. Abel's offering of the lamb for the atonement of his sins, the ram offered by Abraham in place of his only son Isaac on Mount Moriah, the Passover lamb that was killed and its blood sprinkled on the doorposts in Egypt. Every lamb offered daily for almost 1,400 years under the law in the offerings. And then finally, that one lamb that was born of a virgin Amen. in the manger in Bethlehem. Amen. 30 years later was the lamb which was proclaimed to take away the sins of the world by John the Baptist. Yes. Isaiah 53, 5 through 7, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Isn't it interesting that in Isaiah, the prophecy of the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ is mentioned in the past tense. Are you with me? Before it ever physically happened, it had already happened. Because when God says something's going to happen, it's done. It's just as good as if it already had happened. He was bruised for our iniquities, chastened for our, uh, uh, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so openeth not his mouth. What an awesome God. Amen what he did for us, how he suffered for us, and how he loves us. 
the shepherds were witnesses for the Lamb of God. Look at verse number 17 and 18. Not only the angel of the Lord and the angels, but also the shepherds, they witnessed. 17 and 18, and when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. Amen. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the what? I mean, they saw that miracle and they went and told everybody that would listen. They told everybody that would listen. You know, there used to be a day when somebody gets saved and boy, they'd tell everybody that would listen. Yeah. Yeah. They got saved and it's like, man, I got saved. Changed. The good news. The good news. They wanted people to know. They wanted the people to know that they got born again. They would tell their family and their friends and all of it. I got saved. Amen. How many people have you told about Jesus since you've been born again? Look at this. I mean, they saw this babe in the manger. And look at what it says. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. What did they do? They repeated what the angel of the Lord said. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. And the people that heard it wondered. They were in wonder. They were bewildered, so to speak, of what was said. They wondered about it. They thought about it. They, man, amazing. And you know what? Listen to me. People may act like they're not listening. People may act like they don't care. Say it anyways. Say it anyways. I'm telling you. Listen, you will not be sorry because those people, they cannot get away from Scripture. Amen. They cannot get away from it. There is something about the Word of God that just, once it gets planted, once those seed has been delivered, it just starts to work. Yeah. Yeah. It starts to work. It starts to work. Amen. Do you remember when you first heard? Yeah. Remember when God began to stir and all of a sudden there was something going on on the inside? You've been listening to preaching or you've been here, you got a gospel track or, or, or I, I just that, that cultivating of your salvation and all of a sudden, little by little, it just began to work. Man, it's the Word of God. And God's word, it accomplishes what God sent it out to accomplish. Amen. Amen. It does. And some people, they get to that place, but that work is done. And I think that work is done in every person's life. When they hear the word of God, I believe it is it works. Because God's word does what God says it'll do. Amen. There's nobody that's going to escape that. Now, they may reject it. But that work is still done. God still does his part. Can I get a witness? Amen. They witnessed for him. Let's not miss the opportunity to witness for Christ this Christmas, every day of our life, really. So we see the wonderful witness. We see the angels. We see, we see uh, the shepherds. And lastly, I want you to slip on down to verse number 25. And quickly, I want you to see Simeon. <clears throat> and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Come on. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. Man. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the what? be able to come into the house of God by the Spirit. Amen. That's my earnest desire every time I get behind this pulpit. Woo. That the Holy Spirit of God yes. would be by the Spirit. Turn over to Revelation. Yes. Revelation. Yes. Man, do we need God's presence. Amen. We need his stirring and his working in our hearts and lives. Look at what it says in this passage. Revelation, Revelation chapter number one. Man, I love this. Pick it up in verse number nine. I, 
I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation Amen. and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Do you get that? The Apostle John, the man that God used to pen down the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. the book of Revelation. He said, I, John, who also am, that's present tense, your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 10. I was in the what? Spirit. On the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Man, to be in the spirit on the Lord's day. Amen. As a pastor, the desire of my heart is to every time I preach, to preach in the spirit. Amen. Every time I talk to somebody about Jesus is to be in the spirit. And you know what? That ought to be a desire for each and every one of us to walk and live in the spirit as much as we possibly can. And man, it will transform our lives. We see the witness of this man, Simeon, over in Luke chapter number 2. In verse number 25 and 26, it says here, he says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. Yes. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now, I said this man was old. And he came by the Spirit in the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. This guy was old and he wanted to be done his course. Are you with me? Amen. I've seen it. Time for me to go home. <laughs> Are you with me? And so this man who was told by the Holy Spirit something. He was a patient man. He was patient. He waited for years to see the Lord's anointed, Amen. to see that. And we could be so impatient. We would pray for something within a couple of days, and it hadn't happened, and we are just either undisciplined or we just... The faith that it takes to pray something. Don't quit. Don't give up. You want something from God? Keep praying. Yes, sir. Yes. Keep praying. Don't give up on God. God does hear and answer prayers. And if you keep praying something, then when it does happen, you'd be like, but if you pray something and don't keep praying it, and 15 years down the road it does happen, and you're not praying about it anymore, there's a good chance you won't even recognize that God did it. Are you with me? And then you get the blessing of God answering your prayer, but he doesn't get the praise for doing it. Are you with me? Man, get some discipline and be patient on God. He does things in his time, and many times it's a long time away. Listen, I could never be more happy that my mama got saved after 20 years of praying. Amen. I'm glad I didn't give up on it. I'm glad that I continued to pray, continued to try and be a witness, continued to try and live the life that I should live, though I failed many times. But I think the overall emphasis of my life is pointed towards Christ. And I believe people can see that. And boy, it's worth having patience with God. And Simeon was patient. But man, when he's seen the Lord, he's like, Lord, take me home now. Amen. I'm ready to go. 
<laughs> Praise the Lord. And not only that, look at verse number 29 with me. And it says, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Simeon wasn't just patient, but he was prepared. He was prepared to see the Lord, and he was looking for the Lord. He was looking for the Lord. And when the Lord showed up, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I did it. <laughs> I made it. There he is. And he was prepared when Jesus showed up. Amen. And this morning, are you ready for Jesus to come today? If Jesus came today, what's your thoughts? What's your thoughts? Is there some people I haven't talked to? Is your thoughts, I'm not really sure if I'm saved. Simeon was prepared yep. because as soon as he saw him, he's like, Lord, let's go. I'm done. The rapture is coming. Yes. Yes. Jesus is coming again. Yes, he is. And well, I don't, when, when Jesus comes to meet us in the clouds, I don't want to try and try and I've got on the way up thinking, man, I didn't witness to that person. Man, that person in my family doesn't know about you. Boy, how awful. How awful. Listen, be prepared when he comes. John chapter number 20, verse 29 to 31, the Bible says, Jesus saith unto them, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. The purpose of the book of John is that we might believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a salvation book. And when we look at this and we see in this passage, he was prepared. Are you prepared to meet the Lord? When the rapture happens, are you going to get to heaven with regret? If you're saved in here, say amen. amen. Is there going to be regret when you get to heaven? Is there going to be people that you haven't talked to about Jesus? Is there going to be things that God impressed on your heart to do, but you just wouldn't do them? Are you with me? Listen, we're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. We're not going to go to hell. We're saved. If you're saved in here, say hallelujah. hallelujah. But we are going to be at the judgment seat of Christ where he's going to judge his, his church. And each one of us are going to give an answer to the good and the bad. That's what the Bible says. And listen, I don't know about you, but I hope that that judgment goes well for me. And I hope it goes well for you. Amen. And I encourage you, if there are people in your life that you haven't talked to about Jesus, please, please be bold in your witness. Be bold in your witness. Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. I pray you'd help us. 
pray you strengthen us. Lord, I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about spiritually, Father. We need spiritual strength. We need to grow in your grace and in your knowledge. Help us not to to, to be complacent or ho-hum about this matter of salvation and the souls of people around us. God, you've left us here for this matter of the Great Commission to tell others of you, to witness. And Father, from the moment you showed up on this earth, witnessing began to happen. Witnessing began to happen. You gave us the example of the angel of the Lord. It was example to us by the shepherds and so many others that witnessed of Jesus Christ throughout the age. We have no excuse. We've got multitudes of good examples. And Father, I do pray, Lord, that you'd encourage us and strengthen us. Help us to be bold in our witness. And we know that that witness will be bold if we're filled with your spirit. And we will speak the word of God with boldness. And Father, I do pray, Lord, that as we approach Christmas these next couple of weeks, Lord, help us not to lose focus of the reason, the reason for Christmas and the celebration for us. Lord, help us to keep our focus on you. Help us to, to make Christmas about you. Help us to, to worship you. Help us to make you the focus of our Christmas day. Lord, please. Help us, help us to, to, if there's family traditions and things like that with, with each and every one in this room, Lord, help our traditions to be Christ-honoring. Yes. And Lord, for those that may be in a, a divided home, Father, and maybe not have the, the ability to, to necessarily change it, but Lord, maybe to, to add some things that would bring some focus to Christmas in their situations. Lord, to be a light and a witness to those in their homes that aren't. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you'd give us boldness, give us courage. Help us to honor you throughout this season and not get caught up in all the hustle, the bustle, and the commercialization of Christmas, but help us to, to be caught up in you, the true, the true story. Amen. And Lord, I pray, Father, Lord, that you'd touch every heart here today. Help us. We need your presence, Lord. We're living in wicked days. And God, I pray, Father, that you would just do a mighty work in and through us into our families. Lord, everybody in this room has people that need to be saved. And God, I pray, dear God, you'd be working in those family members during this time. Help them to recognize the true reason for this season. Father, please, I pray that your son's name would be glorified and magnified in our families. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. I pray you bless now this invitation. Work and move as only you can. Help each one of us to be obedient to your spirit. In Jesus' precious holy name, we pray the power of his blood we plead. Amen. With everyone standing, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If you know 100% for sure you're going to heaven when you die, would you slip your hand up as a testimony to heaven? God sees those hands. You can put them down. Thank you for that. Child of God, did God speak to your heart about something today? Did he deal with you about this matter of talking to people about Jesus? Did he deal with you about some other matter? Maybe some of your Christmas has just been way too commercialized. Maybe you need to rein that in and get that refocus back on Jesus and the birth of Christ. And listen, the simple fact is, is he was born to die. He was born in a cradle so that we could see him on a cross. And Lord, help us to recognize that truth. Help us to lift up the name of Jesus amongst our family members. Father, you're awesome and you're powerful and you're magnificent. Work as only you can. In Jesus we pray, amen. Listen, if God spoke to your heart this morning, would you slip your hand up as a testimony to heaven? God sees those hands. The piano's going to begin to play. If God spoke to you, if you can kneel around the altar, get around the altar. If you can't, the front row is wide open for you to come and take a seat and talk to God. Take that step. It's important. Draw nigh to God. God will draw nigh to you. The piano's playing. Why don't you come?